Hi folks, welcome. We'll get started in another minute or so. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Gianna. I'm one of the reference librarians here at the Chelmsford Public Library. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's program, Artistic New England, Connections with Bruce Magnuson, our presenter. Um, New England is a region rich in history, culture, and natural beauty, so it is not surprising that many artists have lived and made art here. In the first part of a series, we will look at some writers, painters, and patrons with connections to each other and New England. We will travel to various locations throughout New England that were their home and or inspiration. To start with, Edith, Edith Wharton, Isabella Stewart Gardner, Sarah Orne Jewett, Celia Thaxter, and Chil Tassam. Being sponsored by libraries, we will also highlight some of the many books that are relevant to the artist's themes and locations. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to our presenter, Bruce. Thank you so much, Gianna. Welcome everyone on this chilly New England evening to talk about uh, some of the art in our area. So first of all, thanks to Chelmsford for hosting this and Gianna and the co-sponsors of this are Groton Library, Groveland Library and Tewksbury Library, all members of the Merrimack Valley Library Consortium. So thank you so much. And I kind of start out uh, with a little geographic centering here as to where we are, what we're gonna be talking about. And typically these presentations, one of the beauties of Zoom is we get to have people all over the place. I see somebody already just said they're from Westport, Connecticut. So if you wanna pop in the chat um, where you're from, um, I'm not assuming everybody is intimately familiar with New England, but um, this is kind of a grounding of really New England here, what we're looking at and what we're gonna be talking about. Here I am in beautiful Chelmsford, 30 or so miles Northwest of Boston. We're going to be venturing out to the Berkshires, uh, out to Lenox. We're going to be in the Boston, Cambridge area, and then we'll shoot up north uh, to southern Maine here in South Berwick and off the coast of Maine and New Hampshire in the Isles of Shoals. So I do see most folks here from the New England area, North Carolina, however, New Jersey. I'm heading down to New York tomorrow and uh, Utah, okay, Charleston, South Carolina. Wow. It's always amazing the breadth of folks we get in Zoom. So we'll hop into it here and uh, kind of give you an overview of what our program is going to be like tonight. As Gianna mentioned at the beginning, we're going to be covering um, these artists and patrons. Uh, when I kind of put this together, I didn't really have a theme of focusing on women. However, that's how it did kind of come about. So the time frame we're talking about is pretty much the late 1800s and the early 1900s. So the fact that we have a significant amount of women artists and patrons is actually not the norm. So that's fairly exciting. And we're gonna start off with Isabella Stewart Gardner, move over to Edith Wharton, uh, author, and then another author, Sarah Orne Jewett, and a poet and uh, uh, um, nonfiction writer Celia Thaxter, Celia Layton Thaxter, and we'll finish off with the lone man in the group, Child Hassam, who is American Impressionistic painter, and then we'll do kind of a summary of what we're talking about. So if you do have any questions, I will try and uh, kind of take a look at the Q&A as we go from section to section, if you have any as we go along, because we are going to kind of, uh, you know, talk about these people separately, although, you know, the overarching theme here is connections. So I'm going to talk about how these folks interrelated during this time frame and a couple of other major artists who are kind of in the, the spoke of the wheel here when we talk about the relationships among these folks. So we'll start off with Isabella Stewart Gardner, um, born in 1840 and died in 1924. The image on the right is a portrait of her that's in the Gardner Museum in Boston's Fenway. That was painted by John Singer Sargent. He's certainly one of the gentlemen that we'll be talking a lot about tonight as far as his influence and interaction with these folks. Um, so Gardner was actually born in New York and she married Jack Gardner. She was known as Mrs. Jack um, from Boston. So she moved up from New York to Boston and that became a bone of contention 
This is, um, I would say this is prior to the Yankees Red Sox rivalry, but um, actually she was a huge Red Sox fan. So the Red Sox were in play here, but the New York Boston thing was real and she was quasi ostracized from society, Boston society, the Brahmins. Um, she was from New York. That wasn't really, uh, that was frowned upon, but they lived at 152 Beacon Street. And uh, unfortunately, her only son passed away in a, with an illness, I think it was scarlet fever, um, just before his second birthday. And she was not able to have any more children. So she is this, you know, um, rich woman in Boston. Um, you know, the focus at that time was children and, and child rearing and, and all that stuff. And she couldn't do that. So what she ends up devoting herself to is to traveling and acquiring art. And so she ends up um accumulating this and the, the house at 152 beacon street um starts to kind of bulge at the edges and so she does convince her husband to buy the house next door and expand into that which they do um, but it keeps she keeps growing and keeps acquiring and as a result um she ends up with this museum but um in the course of that she is acquiring these uh, items and she's not doing it on her own but she is traveling and so you'll see that as a theme with a couple of these folks here, that they are intrepid travelers. And so she certainly is that. And she also has contact with um, some pretty heavy hitters in the art world. One of them is Charles Eliot Norton, who is a professor at Harvard. And he basically was the first American professor of art history. So he becomes a very, very big confidant of hers. And he, um, she attends lectures as once again, she was pretty much the only woman who was attending these lectures. Um, she becomes very involved in this um, uh, subject matter of art. And then Bernard Berenson uh, is a contact she has in Boston. He kind of becomes her agent over in Europe and acquires a lot of the works um, that she does acquire and currently reside in the Gardner Museum. And with her status in society, she does host and hobnob with many of the literati of the age. Uh, she, like I said, she was an eccentric. You know, she would wear a Red Sox paraphernalia, which certainly was not something that was de rigueur for somebody of her status back in the early 1900s. Um, There's a famous uh, New Year's Eve party she had where she had champagne and donuts. Uh, Edith Wharton, who somebody will talk about next, um, attended that and was not impressed. And Edith Wharton also came from New York society. So you see kind of these cross currents that, that come amongst these people. And as I mentioned her travels, the gardener actually had a uh, exhibit back in the spring that focused on her travels. She was a um, an interesting woman in the fact that she created um, these travel journals that were illustrated with pictures. So photography, you know, was a thing. It wasn't certainly as easily accessible as it is today, but still, you know, it wasn't, you know, all didn't have to bring your, you know, huge camera with a, a black hood and everything to take a picture. There was some portability to it. So she had a lot of images and she created these books and they exist. And so this exhibit at the uh, at the gardener back in the spring highlight a lot of these things. And one of them that we're going to talk about um, fairly in detail is Italy. Um, she spent a lot of time in Italy and a lot of time traveling in Italy. But as you can see from the map here, you know, she was everywhere from Mexico, certainly a lot of Europe, um, a lot of Asia, which is, you know, pretty extreme. You know, she's in India. She's out in Indi uh, Indonesia. She's in Japan. So she is incredibly well-traveled. And that absolutely plays into a lot of the stuff that she acquires for the Gardner Museum. And a place that she meets a lot of these folks and these cross currents of artists is at the Palazzo Barbaro, which is in Venice on the Grand Canal. And it actually was owned by a couple from Boston, Daniel and Ariana Curtis. And it was kind of like an early Airbnb in the fact that folks could basically rent it out. And obviously you had to have some means. And so this became a place that was very, very um, systematically occupied by a whole mess of folks in the uh, time frame we're talking about. And a lot of these people were in the arts. We have our man, John Singer Sargent, Henry James is also another person, the author Henry James, actually an American author, born in, in New York once again, but he ended up being an ex expatriate and lived most of his time over in Europe. Um, James, James McNeil Whistler, who was actually from Lowell, although he really didn't want that to be. <laughs> uh, he couldn't avoid it, but uh, he tried to get away from it. And so once again, he was an expatriate and he lived uh, over in Europe for most of his life. Robert Browning, the poet, and Claude Monet, of course, the famous impressionistic painter. So you have a lot of these friends cycling through this palazzo in Venice and Isabel is over there. And so she is interacting with these folks. And, you know, once again, all the cross currents are kind of producing a lot of uh, interesting discussions.
And so I did have the uh, privilege of being in Venice uh, this spring, and uh, the Danielli Hotel was one of the more famous hotels there. It dates back to the 14th century. It wasn't a hotel back then. I mean, it was a monastery or, or something, but the building itself dates, dates back to the 14th century. Um, just for reference, I believe at the time we were there in April, the uh, rates were around $2,000 a night for a room at the Hotel Danielli. Um, needless to say, we were not staying there, but I wanted to see the inside. So I dragged my family down there. And um, it's one of these places where you walk in, there's a sign that basically says, you know, you can't move, go any farther unless you're um, staying here. But fortunately, the guy at the front desk was very, very nice and he let us in. And so as we were walking around in the lobby, I'm looking up going like, oh, my gosh, this is the Gardner Museum um, uh, courtyard. And so we'll see that in a second. But uh, this is, you know, kind of what Isabella is designing her museum on. So her museum is the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum over here in the back fence of Boston. Um, this is a museum of fine arts. Uh, this is Huntington Avenue here, Route 9. So basically kind of diagonally across um, is the Gardner Museum. And this is the fence here with actually a lot of, a lot of monuments here I talked about in a previous presentation or right across the muddy river here. But this is where she builds it. And at the time, you know, the late 1800s, early 1900s, um, this is basically kind of swampland. Um, but you know, she needs the space. Um, uh, at this point, I believe her husband has passed away. He died relatively early. Um, so she begins construction on this uh, Italian villa in the Fens of Boston. And so it opens in 1903. At the time that she was alive, it was known as Fenway Court. It doesn't become the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum until after she passes away in 1924. So you see, once again, that the courtyard here I was alluding to at the, you see at the Hotel Danielli, this is actually the Gardner Museum. And as I was chatting with Gianna before this program started, this is an amazing place to go at this time of year, since it is truly an oasis. Um, as we have the cold and darkness here in, in eastern New England. And this place is just amazing with the light pouring in and the vegetation and everything else. So it's really quite a space. And uh, it is a great space for photography and the light coming in. Yeah, I can say it's very distinctive, you know, Italian Venetian architecture here with the windows, um, all this kind of uh, ornamentation, everything is all very Venetian. And she also collects a lot of art that is related to Italy and to Venice. And this is the Lido, which is in the lagoon uh, that Venice shares. And it's by the, uh, the uh, artist Ralph, Ralph Wormley Curtis in 1884, returned from the Lido. Uh, but the piece de resistance that still is in the Gardner that wasn't stolen in the, the heist in the early 19, 1990, I think it was, um, is The Rape of Europa by Titian. And Titian is, was a Venetian Renaissance artist. Uh, this is from 1562, and it is in a room that is named the Titian Room at the Gardner. So it's a very eclectic museum. Eclectic probably undersells it. It's an incredibly um, different museum. Um, it's is her collection. You know, they're not organized together as you normally would with normal, quote unquote, normal museums. Um, and it's a fascinating one to kind of wander around. It is difficult to be, visit on the weekends because it is very, very crowded. And there aren't a lot of if, kind of like any really name plates or anything that uh, with the artwork. So it can be kind of difficult to see this stuff. A lot of it's small. It's a lot of eccentric, you know, eccentric how she had organized this stuff. But it is an absolutely fascinating place to visit. And our friend John Singer Sargent was a, um, uh, she was a patron of his. And like I say, we had a couple of different self-portraits that were done by Sargent of Gardner. But this is a very, very large um, painting that is pretty much near the entryway, entryway. When you first come into the museum, you kind of have these people looking at it to give it a bit of scale. El Aleo um, by John Singer Sargent, 1882. It's a flamenco scene in Spain, very dramatic. Um, I have to say, from my perspective, kind of my favorite Sargent, because he was obviously noted for portraits, which we'll get to at the end of the presentation. But um, this one is just fascinating with its subject matter and its uh, construction and its darkness. And it's a, it's a beautiful painting, and it is absolutely ginormous as you come into the entryway. And so she's ended up uh, buried in the Gardner crypt in Mount Auburn Cemetery. So... Another connection we have with uh, a few of the folks in here is Mount Auburn Cemetery, which, as we'll see here, is in Cambridge. This is the cemetery here. See, this is Harvard Square. Cleverly enough, Mount Auburn Street actually ends up uh, in Mount Auburn Cemetery and uh, right by Fresh Pond. 
once again, an urban oasis. Um, I will say, you know, get one of the maps of the cemetery if you go there, because these things are, <laughs> are devilishly complex as you go through here looking for various graves. But it was the first garden museum, a garden um, cemetery in the United States. It was uh, constructed in 1839. So it is a beautiful, beautiful, um, I said oasis. It is a cemetery, but, you know, it's got beautiful trees and landscape uh, architecture, uh, Forest Hills, which is um, and south of Boston, um, was one that comes a bit later, but there was two of the first garden cemeteries uh, in the United States. And as a photographer, it's one of my favorite places to photograph. So these are a couple of uh, infrared images, infrared black and white images taken in the summer. This one's actually uh, Mary Baker Eddy, the founder of Scientology, and that's her tomb here with the reflection in the lake this is the famous sphinx so it's, it's got i mean as you go to this place like i said it's kind of a you know a maze and you do particularly when the trees are in bloom you know you can't see so if you kind of turn the corner and there's a very fascinating uh type of uh memorial to somebody and uh it makes for really cool photography pretty much in all four seasons it's the beauty of it too is it's a since it's a garden cemetery you get the flowers in the spring you obviously have your fall foliage we have here in new england um in the summer it uh, has tremendous amount of trees and infrared photography is really really good in the summer because you really kind of want a lot of foliage so you have these two shots here which, which accentuate that with the leaves on the tree kind of turn white when you go uh, infrared and you have kind of the topiary here that plays off against the chapel so it's a very very beautiful place and can also give as cemeteries do a bit of ominous to it and this was taken in the fall the leaves late fall as the leaves are off the trees and um oh somebody corrected me i said scientology right it's christian science not scientology i apologize with mary baker eddie it was christian science um so you see here the leaves are off the trees and you kind of have these you know vines hanging down and uh, you can get some really really interesting auras here from the cemetery so with the different seasons, as I said, you can get very, very different perspectives of the cemetery, and it's a, a pretty neat place to go. And a lot of people, famous people, um, were buried there. As I mentioned, Mary Baker Eddy, Christian Science, uh, architect Buck Buckminster Fuller. You go anywhere from not all these are artists. You have B.F. Skinner, the psychologist, Charles Bullfinch, the architect, Kirk Gowdy, the sportscaster. Um, then you do have artists like Winslow Homer, but there's a lot of famous people paying, uh, buried there, and I would be remiss if I don't say the very famous photographer out of MIT, Minor White, is buried there. So it's, a, it's an interesting place. And as I mentioned before, I do want to kind of highlight some of the books that were, uh, are related to these folks that we talk about. And there are no shortage of books about uh, Isabella um, and recent ones. Uh, Gondola Days is a book that came out about 10 or so years ago, 20 years so years ago, that talks about the Palazzo Barbaro and the circle of uh, intellectuals and artists that frequented that place. Um, there is a recent biography that just came out. It was written by two people who are, I believe one's a curator, maybe both curators at the Gardner Museum. It came out in 2022, relatively short biography and gives you a, a good overview of her life. Um, a novel that came out this year, The Lioness of Boston by Emily Franklin. Um, it's a fictional account of Gardner. This is one of the more interesting ones, is the Memory Palace of Isabella Stewart Gardner. Like I mentioned, the museum is very eclectic, and this book kind of plays on that, and it's a bit of a stream of consciousness book, and it goes through, weaves through kind of some of the themes and the objects that are in the Gardner Museum, and it gave me a more of an appreciation of how the next time I go back to the Gardner, I really need to pay attention a lot more to what's in that museum. And then uh, the kind of standard biography that came out about 50 years ago, almost 60 years ago, was Mrs. Jack um, by Lewis Hall Tharp. That was the kind of um, standard biography until some of the more recent ones come out, but it's a fascinating place. So with that, we will switch over to Edith Wharton, and uh, probably the one that people are most familiar with, a uh, famous author. She once again was born in New York City. She does end up becoming an expat and dies in France. Um, she was the first woman to win a Pulitzer Prize for fiction, which she did in 1921 for the Age of Innocence. Um, she didn't actually publish her first book until she was 40 years old. She ends up publishing 15 novels seven novellas and 85 short stories. And as I mentioned with Isabella, she's a very intrepid traveler and people have tallied that she traveled across the Atlantic Ocean um, at least 60 times. And of course, this is all by boat. Um, there was no airplane travel when she was doing her traveling. So that's a lot of transatlantic crossings. 
So I will, this is a four minute video from PBS that kind of gives an overview of her and talks a little bit about the Mounter house out in Lenox, which we'll delve into a little more deeply. Even today, Edith Wharton occupies a place as one of America's leading literary ladies. She was born into the upper crust of old New York in the mid-1800s, a member of high society who also exposed it through the prism of her pen. Wharton wrote more than 40 books in 40 years, including Ethan Frome and The Age of Innocence, for which she became the first woman awarded the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. Today, she is also remembered for her home, The Mount. And if ever a house could serve as an autobiography, the Mount is it. Situated on a hill overlooking a lake in Lenox, Massachusetts, the Mount was conceived by the writer from the ground up. She dreamed its location, guided its aesthetic principles, and designed right. her elaborate gardens. It was, in a sense, her own house of mirth, which she wrote while living here. This house was an opportunity for her to really do things the way she thought they ought to be done, and that was to really champion a return of classicism, symmetry, balance, proportion, uh, lots of light, and, and really opening up spaces, and to make them livable. We spoke with the Mount's Kelsey Mullen in Wharton's drawing room. The house's largest room when it was built in 1902, she used it to entertain frequent guests like fellow writer Henry James. They were very, very good friends um, and she, she matched him in literary skill, I think, towards the end. Wharton designed her home practically. No space went unused. It was large but not grand and it favored her predilection for privacy. Despite carefully crafted images of Wharton as a writer staged in her library, she actually wrote elsewhere. Edith Wharton had always done her best work writing in bed. That was where the creative genius uh, inspired her. And so I think in building the mount, she created a, a space where she could have the privacy she needed to get her best work done. She did love her library, though, and a full two-thirds of her collection has been returned to the mount. What does her library tell us about her? It's been a remarkable window into Edith Wharton's intellectual life. She was reading across genres, really a voracious learner, and she was reading in five different languages, sometimes ancient Norse when she, when she was feeling up for a challenge. She was reading books on astronomy and um, theology. Her books are riddled with marks, notations, and destruction. Dismayed with one publisher's choice to feature illustrations in one of her books, she found a remedy. In her own copy of The House of Mirth, uh, you can see on the title page, she has crossed out the name of the illustrator <laughs> in pencil, and then there, all of the illustrations have been razored out of the book. Amazingly, Wharton considered herself a better landscape gardener than novelist, although that's slightly less astonishing when you see her gardens, which, fully recreated, appear as Wharton saw them. She built the garden in stages as she was receiving advances from her books. Um, and it was during that time that she's taking these European ideas and placing them in an American context and fitting together a French garden with an Italian garden and a, an English lime walk all on the shores of a Massachusetts lake. All of this is a welcome second chapter to the Mount's history. Threatened with foreclosure just five years ago, the home has managed to climb out of its fiscal hole and is now running in the black. A footing regained, today the Mount is positioning itself as the Berkshires' literary hub, drawing the attention of writers the world over. Its champions also include former First Lady Laura Bush, who first fell in love with Ethan Frome as a West Texas schoolgirl. People read Wharton and realize that, in fact, while a lot has changed, a lot is still very much the same. And she just is so clean and muscular in the way that she sort of expresses it and observes it that um, her writing is as relevant today as it ever was. Meaning this is Edith Wharton's renewed Age of Resonance. Okay, so we'll kind of once again level set where we are here. This is Western Massachusetts, Berkshire County, and this is Lenox. Um, Lenox was actually known as the Inland Newport. So there were 60 plus mansions in the area. I don't think, I don't know, maybe only a handful still exist, but in its heyday in the late 1800s and early 1900s, there were a lot of mansions in Lenox. So it wasn't, you know, just some sort of random place that she, she chose. She did build it, she does build it in 1980, build it in 1902 and only lived there until 1911. 
where she moved to France. And after World War I, she only comes back to America once, which is to receive an honorary doctorate from Yale. But back to the connection part, the interesting thing is the family she buys the land from is actually John Singer Sargent's family. So um, she buys the land for this uh, house um, from them and builds it from scratch as the video shows. And we'll get more into that in a second. That's actually very key to what uh, she ends up doing. And as soon as you walk in, this is the entrance, it's actually the back of the house. Um, but you come in this way, and as you come in the door, there is this plaque that said this house was built in 1902 by Edith Wharton. So no shortage of humility, I guess, but um, it is a beautiful place. And once again, it's a beautiful place in the summer for infrared photography. Um, and it's, you know, the gardens are amazing. We'll get a little bit more into that. And you can see very French in this, you know, stuff about very similar to like Luxembourg Gardens, uh, the way that the trees are sculpted. And this is an archway that looks actually out over the lake. And these are some more of the, the beautiful trees. And I was out there just a few weeks ago. And this is how it looks in late autumn. And uh, most of the leaves have fallen, but it's a, it's a beautiful place. And it's got beautiful grounds. That's one of the really, really charming things about it. Um, the house itself, as we'll see in a second, is certainly beautiful. But, uh, you know, as they mentioned, that she was kind of considered her landscape skills uh, more than her literary skills. And this is certainly a beautiful place. And they've been able to restore it. As I mentioned in the video, this place has gone through a lot of iterations. Um, as people have heard me talk before, I grew up in uh, Albany, around Albany, New York, which is actually fairly close to the Berkshires. And for years, this was actually the home of a Shakespeare company called Shakespeare and Company, which is still out in Lenox, but this was their performance space for about 20 years. And then it became a separate, excuse me, foundation in you know, 2001, I think. And they had to put in a lot of renovation. They had to actually put in some steel beams. It was actually all wood construction. And they put some like stucco over it, but the actual construction, the uh, the bones, so to speak, of the house are actually wood, but it was kind of falling apart. So they ended up putting some steel beams in it in the lower part of it. Uh, but at this point now, it's very well restored. Um, some of the rooms don't have a lot of furniture. They're actually museum type rooms. Uh, but you can go into a lot of it. You can go down into the basement. You can see the kitchen areas. We'll see in a second. But it's uh, it's quite a beautiful spot. And the first book she has published is The Decoration of Houses in 1897. And um, he, she co-wrote it with Ogden Codman Jr., who was an architect. And it's still used today. There's actually a book, as I referenced it at the end, that you know talks about the principles that were put with this. And they're still being uh, adhered to today. So she was very, very into the interior. And as they talked about, you know, the house is nice, but not grand. And so one of her famous quotes is, thus all good architecture and good decoration, which it must never be forgotten, is only internal architecture, must be based on rhythm and logic. A house or a room must be planned as it is because it could not in reason be otherwise, must be decorated as it is because no other decoration would harmonize as well with the plan. So her library um, you know, is a beautiful space. And this is a picture of you know, when she was there. And this is it today. And as the video said, they were able to get back a large portion of her library because it had been dispersed to the winds after she left and different owners took over and the house went through all different kind of gyrations. And so her library was kind of, um, you know, I went to disperse if one person had it, but they were able to reacquire it, I think around 2006. For, it was in the millions of dollars, but they were able to get it. And like the video said, there's a lot of her annotations in it. So from a scholarship perspective, um, it's critical. And uh, it's amazing to have that kind of resource at the house today. And this is one of the upstairs hallways, kind of the best representation of what she's talking about as far as, you know, kind of a human scale of architecture. Um, obviously, it's very nice. Uh, it's certainly any hallway I have. But, um, you know, it's not, you know, Newport Breakers type thing. Um, so it is, it is beautiful. And uh, it does have a very nice vibe to it. And this was um, her writing area. Well, once again, they kind of set up as a writing area. As a video said, she actually wrote in bed. This is kind of interesting. The fact this is in the dining room and this was a painting that is actually plastered into the wall. And so when she left the house, she had a choice to either leave it there or basically have it chiseled out and removed. 
and she ended up uh, ended up uh, having leaving it there. But unfortunately, her husband Teddy Warden, who is from the family of the Warden School of Business at UPenn, um, he had a lot of mental issues, and their marriage kind of fell apart. And she ended up going to they ended up basically leaving the house, and she ended up going to France, and they ended up getting divorced. And as mentioned, Henry James was a very, very, very close friend of hers. So there's one of the rooms there, which doesn't really have a lot of furniture in it, has some museum stuff and talks about different things that happen with the house. But there was a plaque outside. It was a Henry James guest room and they were very close. Henry James was a big correspondent with Isabella Stewart Gardner. Um, you know, Edith Wharton was a legitimate intellectual. You saw from that video, though, you know, she's reading in Old Norse. <laughs> she you know, was fluent in like five languages, you know, reading science. So she's a legitimate intellectual. Isabella Stewart Gardner was not, um, at least under that criteria. So Henry James does have some letters where he's a little bit dismissive of, of Gardner of being, you know, kind of the rich woman who's, you know, not really, you know, a bona fide artist and which he's not, um, but a little bit condescending from Henry James. And what I've heard about Henry James, that's not really out of uh, character for him. So as I mentioned, this is the kitchen. I always love the kind of the uh, innards of these houses. And this is actually from her bedroom with an old telephone looking out over the landscape uh, in late autumn. And as I mentioned, uh, so is it, uh, Edith Wharton has no shortage of books. Um, I do find obviously talking about the Mount, this book, The Decoration of Houses is very pertinent. And this is a, a book that just came out a few years ago that uses this called The Classical Principles of Modern Design, Lessons from Edith Wharton and Ogden Cosmos Decoration of Houses. Um, so that was published in 2018. That book itself was 1897. She was from New York. Her most famous books do talk about New York society, but she did write books that are based on the Berkshires. And two of the more famous ones, their novellas, is Ethan Frome, which I think most people have to cycle through at some point in their high school career, it's, uh, written in 1911. And Summer was written in 1917. And of course, the one that she won the Pulitzer Prize with uh, in 1921 was Age of Innocence. So before we go on, I'll take the questions as uh, somebody put into the Q&A about, could I tell us about infrared photography? Yeah, <laughs> I do struggle with um, showing those images and having to explain what infrared is, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, except for the fact that um, infrared is, you know, I mean, look at the electromagnetic spectrum, there's visible light. And then there's the infrared um, part of it, and there's lots of different infrared wavelengths. The ones that are closest to the visible spectrum are ones that you can do for photography. The ones that are further away are the typical infrared you get with when you do like heat sensing. You have a picture of your house taken. You can see where it's losing heat and stuff like that. Thermal pictures, that's using infrared. But for photography, you can get, a, you can get your camera altered because all cameras have a filter on it that filters out infrared because infrared radiation can do clouding effects onto your regular visible light images. So I have a camera that is converted specifically for infrared, a digital camera. Um, there are old days you could do it with film. It was incredibly difficult, had to be very long exposures. Um, so digital infrared is, is is not easy, but it's a heck of a lot easier than film. And I like it for summer because it gives you a very different effect. And typically in summer, uh, midday is not ideal from a lighting perspective. And with infrared, it's ideal because you want to have a lot of basically energy. That's how what shows up on the image is energy. And so if you don't take it, you know, during the height of the day, they become dull. But a, a nice, bright, sunny day with a lot of good kind of foliage. Willow trees are a favorite of mine for infrared. You know, they have the, the looping leaves and everything else. Um, so uh, that is um, uh, explanation of that. And one of the uh, questions, the Codman House uh, and Lincoln Match related. I don't know if that is related to... Uh, to our friend Ogden. Um, I don't know, that's an interesting question. Look into that. So now we'll move to the main coast and a little bit inland to Sarah Orne Jewett, um, the author who was born 1849 and dies in 1909. Um, she's, a doc she's a daughter of a country doctor. She has rheumatoid arthritis from an early age. Um, she is known for her regionalist style, probably somebody that not a lot of folks may be familiar with. She focuses on Southern Maine um, and then after Annie Field's husband's death, James Field, he was a publisher, and we'll get to him in a second, um, she becomes Jewett's lifelong companion, and she was the first woman to be given an honorary doctorate from Bowdoin. So we have Edith getting it from Yale and Sarah Orne June getting it from Bowdoin. 
South Berwick here is on the interior, about 10 miles off the coast or inland off the coast of York, Maine, um, off of the Salmon River, I believe. That's a tributary to the Piscataway that goes into Portsmouth, where the harbor of Portsmouth basically is, and the Great Bay over here near Dover. So I grew up spending a lot of uh, my summer actually on York, Maine and uh, on the coast of York, Maine for about five weeks every summer. My grandfather had a cottage there. And I have to admit, I don't think I ever stepped foot in South Berwick until last year, but um, quite a little town. And this is her house. It was built in 1774. It's currently owned by the Historic New England organization. As properties, they have, uh, I don't know, 20 or so properties within New England. And, uh, you know, it's a, it's a obviously a well-to-do house. Her father was a doctor. Um, you know, it's stepped down from the mount as far as, as far as ostentation just goes, but he's right on the, the center of town of Berwick, uh, South Berwick. This is right on the main street. Um, so it's had a prominent place from when it was built in 1774. And you can see from the wallpaper, um, this is somebody with means. Um, I believe this wallpaper was created from patterns that they were able to find. Um, I always find this fascinating when you go into these older houses and ask about how they came up with some of this stuff. And um, it is kind of crazy how they can reproduce some of this stuff. Most of it obviously is not original because you're not going to get the kind of vibrancy of colors from something that's 250 years old. But there are a lot of these patterns were based on stuff in Europe or were actually bought from Europe. And so they have a way of doing their detective work and coming up with this and restoring it. So it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful place. And being an author, there's a lot of books around, a lot of areas and you know, cubbies that uh, you can write, stained glass window that overlooks the property. And in her bedroom, right outside her bedroom, she had a writing desk. This is where she did most of her work. This is the portrait. Um, of her, not painted by John Singer Sargent, um, but um, there's a portrait of Jewett uh, in her lifetime. And this is one of the more interesting things that I have to say I'm fairly proud I got a photo of this. This is actually her initials that she ca carved into the window in her bedroom with a diamond. And like I mentioned, she had rheumatoid, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. So she was actually you know, had a lot of challenges throughout her life from mobility and things along those lines. And then um, I think about nine years or so before her life, um, before um, she passes away, she is in a carriage accident and that effectively ends her writing career. And so she's pretty much for most part, most um, uh, ways of looking at it, she's bedridden. So she spends a lot of time in this bedroom. And so they have this, you know, original, obviously original pane of glass that she carved her initials into it. And um, I won't get into the nuances of what lens I used to take this picture with, but it was a kind of a funky lens that gives you selective focus. And I was able to get it. So it just selectively focused on that. When you take it with a regular camera, when you have autofocus, it becomes very difficult to focus on something like this in the window because the autofocus will want to go and focus on something outside. So um, kind of have to do manual focus for that. So her famous, most famous work is a novella called The Country of the Pointed Furs. So this is my representation of pointed furs. If you've ever been uh, spending any time in Maine, um, pointed furs are not too hard to come by. Um, full disclosure, these are further north in Maine. They're up more around Acadia than they are down by southern Maine. But um, obviously, this one's actually um, up on Cadillac Mountain. So you can get a really good perspective of the pointed furs with the, the ocean in the background. But um, that's what she's dealing with. And so her most two most famous books are A Country Doctor, which is basically a semi-autobiographical uh, book where she was a country, she was the daughter of a country doctor. Um, the main character of this is a woman who wants to become a doctor and does become a doctor. And it goes into, you know, kind of all the sexism with that. And it talks about, you know, women are telling her, this main character, Nan, like, you know, how can you be a doctor? That's not woman's work. All this kind of stuff so she's talking about that um, they're mostly you know the characters this one in particular the country of the pointed fur she gets into the vernacular um some of the actual um characters you know speak in vernacular it is interesting to have some of these things you know with now with audio books and things along those lines you can have them read and uh, it is interesting experience to actually have that happen and these you know these um, actors basically who do these readings are phenomenal and they will take on the characters they will take on the different cadences um, it's really interesting so from a regional perspective i found them interesting the fact that i spent a lot of time in southern maine this is kind of a different perspective there are certainly you know um 
ocean type things. One of the, the stories in the country of the pointed furs is there's a sea captain and he tells stories of being shipwrecked. So there is that, but it's not overtly like, you know, most of the books about Maine do focus on the coast, obviously. And this does talk about that, but it gets a little more inland. You have more farmers, you know, that kind of stuff. So it gives you a very interesting depiction of what Southern Maine was like in the late 1800s. Um, so, and, and they're short, but I said, they, they do lack plot. I will say that. And as I mentioned, so her lifelong partner after um, Amy Fields' husband passes away um, and James Field and Annie uh, end up with this, basically this publishing house called Tickner and Fields. And so as you can imagine, they're publishing folks. So by publishing stuff, they come into a lot of contact with a lot of these artists. And um, she has a salon. You'll see this. A lot of these, you know, folks have salons. We'll see this next with Celia Thaxter. Um, but she has a house uh, on 146 Charles Street in Boston. And that becomes a salon and a gathering of artists, mostly writers. Um, and you do have, once again, you know, Isabella Stewart Cardner is involved. She does have certainly dinners at her house. And Annie Fields and her husband are guests. Um, Celia Thaxter, who we'll get to in a second, the poet and author off of Appledore, she is there. You have the author Willa Cather. Um, a lot of Henry James, once again, pops up, Rudyard Kipling, Harriet Beecher Stowe, um, you know, Mark Twain, just a lot. I mean, it's just an amazing amount of folks from the 1800s, the kind of the who's who in a lot of ways of American literature. And she is buried at Mount Auburn Cemetery. So we'll move on now to Celia Thaxter. And she was born in 1835 and passes away in 1894. And she's a daughter of a lighthouse keeper. Um, name is Thomas Layton, and he was a lighthouse keeper at uh, White Island, if you're familiar, we'll get to these in a second, of the Isles of Shoals, but the lighthouse out the Isles of Shoals is White Island, and he was the lighthouse keeper out there, and back in those days, the lighthouse keeper was actually a politically appointed position, which I don't think a lot of folks are aware of, but I think he ran for governor of New Hampshire, or some political office didn't win, but he ended up getting appointed as lighthouse keeper, so City of Thaxter grows up on this island, and this island is tiny, I think she has four or five siblings you know it's a typical new england lighthouse with just basically rocks and a little, little tuft of, of green grass and so she ends up spending her childhood there but her father is an intrepid entrepreneur so he ends up opening a hotel i believe in the 1840s on one of the, the largest island in the isles of shoals which is appledore and he opens up a, a hotel called the appledore hotel which is fairly revolutionary in the fact that most of these hotels that you know end up going into the um, uh, White Mountains, certainly up in Bar Harbor in Maine, Adirondacks in New York, all these things that come after the Civil War for people to get away from the heat and the stifle, you know, the industrialization, all the stuff that's happening in the cities. You know, people want to have their summer respites, uh, people with means, and so they go to these different places. He has a place that's actually before the Civil War, so one of the first ones. And so she ends up basically living there. She marries um, a, her tutor, Levi Thaxter, who was an intellectual from Boston, and he introduces her to a lot of cultural luminaries. And she is first published by James and Annie Fields. So that's how she comes to know Annie Fields and, and uh, by turn, Sarah Orne Jewett. Some of her famous books, prose books, are among the Isles of Shoals and an island garden. And a salon does develop at Appledore. So once again, some of the people we've seen from the previous um, uh, Annie Fields, we have seen Nathaniel Hawthorne, we see John Greenleaf Whittier, the poet, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, the actor uh, Edward Thomas Booth, and the painter who will end our program with, Child Hossum. So Appledore is interesting in the fact the Isles of Shoals are these set of, I think it's like nine or so islands off the coast of Maine and New Hampshire, and the state line actually divides these islands. So the ones to the north are in Maine, the one to the south are in New Hampshire. So Appledore, which is the largest, go over here, um, that is in Maine. The one today that you can visit most readily is Star Island. It has the Oceanic House, which is a hotel. Um, that's actually in New Hampshire. And the most infamous is Smutty Nose, which I'll kind of talk about a little bit at the end of the part with um, Celia, is where a famous murder happened uh, in 1871 or 72. Um, but you can visit, I mean, all these places we're going to, um, you know, you can visit, this is the hardest to see. You will we'll see a video on Apple door, but Apple door is a little more, you can get, uh, in the summer, you can get daily boats, go out to Isles, to the star Island. Uh, but Apple door itself, um, doesn't have a hotel anymore. The hotel, the hotel burns, uh, early 1900s, I believe. Um, so to actually see, um, Celia Thaxter's guards look like that, which is still there, um, takes a little bit of doing, I was able to do it and we'll talk about that. But um, this is a photograph of 
the uh, hotel, as you can see, is you know, quite a complex here. You ended up started with one and ended up with uh, multiple buildings here as the hotel for Appledore Island. So it is quite a complex. And unfortunately, like most of these things, they do end up burning down. Um, the one that still exists is the Oceanic Hotel. And that was built in the 1870s or 1880s. And so when you stay there, uh, literally the first half hour after you get off the boat, they give you what is called the fire talk. And they're like, you know, we're seven miles out at sea. There's no fire department that's going to save us. So if you light a cigarette, you're on the next boat home. <laughs> so they take it very seriously, very seriously, because the structure out on Star, um, the Oceanic House, um, kind of, well, doesn't really look like any of these per se, but the size is about that. And, you know, you walk there and it's just, you know, totally wooden structure from the 1870s. It's like, how did it last? So they're very serious about making sure it continues to last. So this is a, a quick video from Chronicle, Channel 5, for those of us in the Boston area, our lovely nightly resource of uh, all things, not, not always New England, but uh, a lot of this focused on New England. This is the story kind of Celia Thaxter and what's going on to uh, Appledore today. They float on the horizon just within sight of land. Nine islands, eight miles off the coast of New Hampshire and Maine, the Isles of Shoals. Access to these tiny granite buttons is limited, but one of these remote rocks, the island of Appledore, is the unlikely location of a famous garden, one that's cultivated quite a following. We have day tours that come and view the garden, and people come out for about four hours, and they have a walking tour, and they get to enjoy time in the garden, and they have lunch in our dining hall. That's true of a lot of invasive species out here. They're Jennifer Seavey, here, executive sure, director of the Shoals Marine Laboratory, a field station on Appledore run jointly by the University of New Hampshire and Cornell University. And because they're isolated on the island, they haven't mixed with the other introduced apple trees on the mainland. Summer students here earn a semester's credit in just two weeks. They're really intensive classes but they're fun because the students are not in a lecture hall all day, they're out here. But as the great Joni Mitchell once said, it's time to get ourselves back to the garden and the lasting legacy of one Celia Thaxter. Celia grew up on a neighboring island, White Island, in a lighthouse. Her dad was a lighthouse keeper and they had a very small patch of land there. So everything green was really precious to her, so she fell in love with plants. In fact, Celia Thaxter published a book about coaxing such voluptuous blooms out of this bony soil. Today, the garden is in the exact location with the exact flowers as described in the Island Garden book. Thaxter planted her garden while working at the Appledore House, a large Victorian era hotel that has since burned down. A published poet, Thaxter hosted many well-known writers and artists, Emerson, Hawthorne, and most especially the painter Child Hassam. The garden is featured in most, a lot of his work, a lot of his early work especially. Hassam fell in love with Appledore, returning time and again to capture its color, texture, and cast of light. It continues to work its charms on artists today. Appledore in particular has been a destination for artists for over 100 years. And I think that's, you know, the same reasons art, artists come out here now is the reasons they came out there then, which is that it's, it's a very elemental place. Chris Volpe is artist in residence at the Shoals Marine Lab. As such, he spends time with the students here, lending his aesthetic sensibilities to their scientific pursuits. The trade-off? Volpe gets a lot of alone time. It's amazing to, to be standing on a rock in the middle of an ocean with n no one else in sight for hours on end. Absent civilization, uh, you get a little closer to the elemental forces, I think, that, that drive the planet and that drive us. There are indeed elemental forces at work on Appledore. Just try not to be too alarmed at the roving bands of youth armed with sticks. No, this isn't Lord of the Flies. Students carry sticks to ward off gulls protecting their newborn chicks. 
and tours of Cecilia Thaxter's garden book so quickly that only one of them remains open this summer. So I'm not sure that those tours um, were since COVID. I don't think they're going anymore, but I was able to go out there uh, to Star Island a number of years ago, probably like 15 years ago or so on a photography retreat, uh, which they don't do anymore either. But um, there's are plenty of retreats and various things you can do at Star Island throughout the summer. And it's not, and they have accommodations out there, different kinds of accommodations. And it's relatively easy to do that. Uh, when I was out there, they did um, charter a boat to take us from Star to Appledore. We had to spend an afternoon in Appledore. And so this is Celia Thatcher's garden. I was there in kind of mid September. So they had plowed it under. There were still a sunflower and you can see the kind of the tower from the marine laboratory but um, it is pretty amazing and you look at it and how they've been able to resurrect that and it is a, a beautiful spot and it is remote and um, it's interesting in the fact that in Kittery on the mainland which if you go south of the outlets on route one in Kittery there's this tiny museum called the Kittery Historical and Naval Museum and it's one of these kind of gems which I said I've been going to Kittery my whole life and didn't stumble upon this until a couple of years ago, but they have an amazing amount of stuff crammed into this small museum. And they have a couple of um, uh, cases that are devoted to Celia Thaxter. And they have these original things. So she was a writer, but she also hand painted pieces of China and also um, illustrated, I don't know if it's illuminated volumes of her work, maybe illustrated volumes of her work with intricate flower designs. So they have actually originals here. And as the video mentioned, Child Hassam. Uh, the famous painter, they actually collaborated on a couple of things. And this is one of the uh, books, A Christmas Story, The Lost Bell, that she wrote, he illustrated. And this is one that she wrote and she herself illustrated. So you see these flowers, these once again are sunflowers um, that are on the pages of the book. So it's a pretty amazing little gem there, um, just south of the outlets and all the chaos that's in the outlets on Route 1. And you have this thing. And as was mentioned, um, you know, her famous prose things are a memorable murder among the Isles of Shoals and an island garden. Now, a memorable murder is what I alluded to at the beginning. There was a, a very infamous murder that takes place on Smutty Nose in 1871 or 72. And Smutty Nose is basically adjacent to Appledore. And one of the women who was killed actually worked at the Appledore Hotel that Cecilia's father uh, ran and owned. So it was, you know, once again, we, we, we seems like every five years you have a crime of the century, but this was one of the crime of this one, the trials of the century, um, pretty much until um, uh, I can't even think of the uh, the woman in Fall River. But um, this gentleman, Louis Wagner, is convicted and hanged, and she writes a, um, a uh, basically I think it's like a twenty piece, twenty page piece on it, and it is considered one of the first examples of true crime. So it's a, you know, eighty year predecessor to Truman Capote's and True Blood, and once again she is, you know, she was on Appledore when it happened. the uh, The murder happened in March, and she was there the night this guy rose out from Portsmouth, kills these two women, and rose back to Portsmouth, and it's a, a very complicated story and you know there's no eyewitnesses directly and everything else but she writes this true crime um considered one of the best prose things in true crime writing um in 1873 which once again is pretty revolutionary for a woman to do that and so we'll finish up here by transitioning to what was referenced in the video is child Hassam, the american impressionist painter who is born in boston in 1859 and dies in 1935. One of his famous paintings here is the Boston Common at Twilight. And he did spend a lot of time on Appledore. So he spent many of his summers um, for a good, you know, 20, 30 years from 1886 to 1916. Uh, and he executed 250 to 300 works, uh, which ends up being about 10% of his lifetime output as an artist. So these are some of the images from Appledore. And once again, it's a very dramatic you know, landscape, seascape. And the interesting thing is um, there's actually a winter caretaker who stays over at Star Island throughout the winter. And she's been doing it for, I want to say, 25 years now. And she's a photographer, Alexandra Destigior. And she does have a Facebook page. You can follow her. And um, it's fascinating. She's out there kind of by herself. I think her boyfriend's out there with her sometimes, but um, it's still a 
pretty desolate place. And you can imagine we have this, you know, huge windstorm coming up in a couple of days. It's going to be 50 to 60 mile an hour winds off the coast. And I'm not sure, you know, being on Star Island would not be my first choice, but it is a, it's a dramatic place. And so child has some spent a lot of time there. And the day that I was on Appledore, uh, I had a few hours to kill. And I, you know, it was about 15 years ago. And I, I came across this picture and I am. I don't know if I was influenced by him or not. Um, I had just kind of amazed when I was putting together this presentation that, you know, this is a photograph I took. This is one of his paintings. And it's just kind of uncanny. That a lot of the same scene is there. And what's really interesting is kind of these yellow tinge, almost like some sort of lichen, some sort of thing on the rocks and a little bit of green growing within the rocks. And so, you know, these were done, you know, probably 70 or 80 years apart, one in photography, one in impressionistic painting, but there's certainly a lot of overlap there. And once again, this is midday, which is typically, you know, in September, midday is not your your great time to take uh, photographs. And, you know, full disclosure, I was actually wandering around looking for shade because there's not a lot of shade on the island. There aren't very many trees. And so it was kind of really hot that day. And I was uh, looking around and kind of came, stumbled upon this scene. And, you know, once again, I'm not sure I had seen this picture before. I don't think I had, but um, it's kind of interesting how they're uh, very similar. And uh, I kind of came across the same thing with this inlet in the rocks. And so another thing I stumbled upon uh, looking for something different, I was actually, I, last presentation I did was on Boston statues a few months ago and I was actually going down Columbus Avenue in, in Boston looking for the Harriet Tubman statue, which was the first statue um, of a woman that was uh, erected in the city of Boston. And walking down Columbus Avenue, I come across Child Hassam Park, which I had never been aware of. And this is a private park right near where he was born. And uh, it's this bucolic space that I guess is maintained by private money. And there's a little kind of relief sculpture of him and a plaque about it. And uh, it's very well maintained. And that was a very, you know, last summer was very hot and humid. And this is certainly a very hot and humid day. So it was a nice place to have a little respite in the shade. But um, there's this still a, a, a memorial, a remembrance of Child Hassam. Um, and I'm sure that most people would not be aware that there's actually a Child Hassam Park in the city of Boston. So. Um, Child Hassam himself, you know, we've kind of come across <clears throat> some of these things of salons and various interactions among <clears throat> a lot of the uh, Illuminati of this particular era. And one thing that Child Hassam was very famous for was he didn't kind of mean an art colony he didn't like. So New England, um, there was no shortage of art colonies in New England during the late 1800s, early 1900s, <clears throat> excuse me. And he uh, did attend a lot of them. But one of the ones that he attended a lot was down in Connecticut, and it's the Florence Griswold House, which is open to the public. Once again, a beautiful, beautiful spot in southern Connecticut. Um, they have a house or house there has been restored, a lot of artwork in there. Um, there are a couple of Hassams in there and uh, various other artists who frequented that art colony, with which went on for quite a while. And Florence Griswold was a woman who kind of basically shepherded that along. And there were art colonies in you know, Provincetown. There were art colonies up in Agunkwit. Um, you know, there are colonies all over the place in um, in New England and um, Child Hassam shows up at a lot of them. So if you want to end up doing kind of another connections, you can find out that Child Hassam and art colonies is one that certainly comes up an awful lot. And there are a few books on him, not as many as the other folks, but there was a book uh, recently, uh, a show that was done. Um, I forget if it was done at the PBD Essex, but there was a show done relatively recently of Child Hassam and the Isles of Shoals, American Impressionism. And that's the, the book that associated with that. And then there was a biography written of uh, him in 2004, Child Hassam. So, um, and once again, in you know, most major museums, the MFA, you know, the Met in New York, um, Child Hassam is certainly in the collection and usually on display. So we'll wrap it up with kind of a summary here. And, you know, I was originally going to call this presentation a few degrees of Henry James, but <clears throat> A, I don't know that much about Henry James. Um, he's kind of a, you know, kind of a, I don't know, curmudgeon, I guess is a term you would use. Um, and there's just a lot of other interactions. But when you do kind of boil down to it, you know, Henry James and John Singer Sargent, you know, come up an awful lot and their interaction, obviously very different people. One's a writer, one's a painter, a singer being a portrait painter, obviously, you know, people had to have means in order to have their painters, uh, their portraits painted by somebody like John Singer Sargent. So just by default, he ends up interacting with a lot of different people um, in that era. And it's just fascinating that, you know, we kind of have within this orbit, all these very different people, but, you know, some similarities and a lot of interaction and cross interaction to them. And I'll, I'll say full disclosure, my wife is the one who put together this um, 
illustration, I was having challenging <laughs> times with uh, PowerPoint and PowerPoint was winning. Um, so she was able to kind of uh, put my ideas, manifest my ideas better than I could. Um, so I think it's an interesting visual depiction of kind of what we're talking about, the kind of the cross-pollination interaction among these um, kind of giants of, uh, of art. And as some may know, there is a show of Sargent's work currently on view at the MFA in Boston. It's on view through December, or excuse me, January 15th. Um, I have not yet seen it. I hope to see it in the next month or so, but it's basically fashioned by um, Sargent and it kind of focuses on, he would um, basically kind of dictate what his models were wearing. So he was kind of a control freak. And so the exhibit does kind of cross um, reference some of the original actual garments that were worn and some of the props he used with the actual paintings. And so he does end up doing 900 oil paintings and over 2,000 watercolor paintings. So there's no shortage of John Singer Sargent work. Uh, if you're familiar with the Boston area, he did do murals both in the Boston Public Library and in the Museum of Fine Arts itself. So there's a lot of references to Mr. Sargent as you go through New England and specifically Boston. He was born in Boston, but did spend most of his time uh, in London and Paris. So he was truly an expatriate. So, uh, where to find me? I'm on Instagram at BMAGPhoto. My photography Facebook page is Bruce J. Magnuson Photography. I do have a website at brucemagnuson.smugmug.com. And if you're interested in a more uh, a deeper dive into Venice, I'll be doing a Zoom presentation for the Cary Library in Lexington in the middle of January on the 17th at 7 p.m. You can register through their website, and I'll go into a little more detail into uh, Venice and uh, I was able to, I guess I was able to do Venice in, in April. And it's a, a fascinating place and a place I couldn't get my head around until I actually went to. And I still say it doesn't make sense, but it makes a little more sense now actually having been there. So with that, thank you so much for your attention. Um, I'd be more than welcome to answer any questions or at least attempt to answer any questions or anything else you might want to throw at me. Um, not too much more infrared photography questions, please. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to sit through that, but anything else you have, let me know. Okay, let me just check the chat here. Okay. Somebody asked about the Sphinx at the, um, why a Sphinx to honor the Civil War dead at the um, uh, Mount Auburn Cemetery. And I, I knew the story of, of that before. It is, it's dramatic because it's right near the chapel. Um, I forget the story. And that's the thing about the Mount Auburn Cemetery. There are all these markers and they have fabulous stories with them. And a lot of them don't jump out as being like very straightforward. Um, so it's an incredible place to wander around and find the stories, but I don't know the specific one of that. Some said they were missing my voice from time to time. That's too bad. Oh, somebody from Charles, South Carolina. There's a child has some painting down there. Lizzie Borden, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, I don't think I see any more questions. So if that's it, is Gianna still there? Hang on. Hello. All right, everybody. Well, thank you again so much for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure as always, Bruce. Um, and yes, please check out his future programs. Um, I'm sure we'll have him back here again soon as well. So just keep an eye out on our um, program calendar on our website or stop by the library and ask us some questions here at the reference desk. Um, thanks again, Bruce, for presenting for us. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Have a good night, everybody.